I think this is the golden age of games because with Kickstarter and print on demand, literally any kind of weird quirky game can get out there. And with the advent of the internet and, and other media, you can make it so other people can learn about your game. And so we can get all kinds, of, like I remember there was a lot of, of, of pressure back in the day of like, you must do a mainstream game. And I never wanted to do mainstream games because to my idea, a mainstream game was always a game that offended as few people as possible, but I wanted to make a game that appealed strongly to some people. And that would be a better seller than a game that everyone kind of didn't hate. Hi, welcome to the Daiku Podcast. I'm Gary Snow. Today, I am honored to welcome one of the true greats of game design and is the creative mind behind Call of Cthulhu and one of my personal favorites, Ghostbusters, as well as other projects such as RuneQuest, Stormbringer, and ElfQuest. Not only has Sandy established himself as one of the premier tabletop game designers, but he has also been key in video game industry working on iconic titles such as Doom and Civilization. It is a true pleasure and honor to have you on the podcast. Sandy, welcome. Hey, happy to be here. Um, yeah, I did a... Uh, uh, I'm Sandy Peterson. I currently own the company Peterson Games, which is doing tabletop board games and role-playing stuff. I did spend 28 years in the... Uh, uh, the crypts of video design, um, but I uh, I did it got out honorably I think, <laughs> and uh, you know, I've I've been through the industry since. I mean, my first published item was 1980, so it's it's that old. Let's uh, like maybe back up a little bit and just tell us like young Sandy, who is young Sandy, and how did you get involved with okay. uh, role playing games? Young Sandy was one of those irritating precocious kids that reads a lot and um has a few close friends i mean i played kickball and marbles and stuff um but i also would uh uh sneak into my dad's stash of books which he kept in boxes because we were gonna planning to move him to a new house in a couple years so he didn't put them on a shelf i sneak out like tarzan and and uh, things like that that's where I, when i was eight years old i first found a lovecraft book and for years i was the only person i knew um, sorry, for years, the old, everyone I met who had heard about Lovecraft had heard about them from me. So it was like really obscure. <laughs> so um, you're spreading the gospel of uh, Lovecraft. Yeah. When I also, when I was eight, <clears throat> my dad bought a copy of the Avalon Hill Gettysburg board game. And I, it was really interesting. We'd lost the rules somehow very early on. So I only had the counters in the map. And I like, was pondering how this thing worked. I loved games. I would actually sometimes stay in from recess to play Clue, you know, or Stratego or something. And uh, so basically all the time growing up, I'm like obsessed with weird books. I'm playing these games. I got into more Avalon Hill games when I was 12, when I actually finally got rules, you know. And then in 1974, um, I was in I just my first year of college. This is where I found uh, Dungeons of the Dragons, the first role-playing game. My friend tried to explain it to me, and it just sounded terrible. Um, but we we decided to give it a try, and then it was it was pretty fun. Although, like, I hated all the parts of it that seemed manifestly unrealistic. You know, like hit points that go up over time, so that you like a high-level guy can't be killed by pushing out of a pushing him out of a skyscraper things like that but uh, but you know and, and the character classes all seemed kind of constrained to me they didn't seem natural but but hey it was the only game in town so we played that for and uh from first edition on up and uh then when other games would come out like traveler or uh or or the fantasy trip or things like or, or uh, alarm uh what's the what's the fgu one alarm not uh um cold finally because they get violated copyright so many times i'm you know not talking about though fgu fantasy games unlimited is that the just final fantasy no 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 oh. uh they were anyway it doesn't matter it was, a, it was another role-playing game that we played and what we would do <clears throat> in college we would play we'd be playing D D, then we'd bring in some new game like the fantasy trip and then we'd play about half D and D and half the new game. That would go on for about for six months to a year. Then we'd go back to D and D, you know. And then in 1978, um, 
or the the game of the flavor of the month was RuneQuest. So we started playing RuneQuest with D&D. But by the end of the year, what had happened is that D&D had been the one that faded out. We were just playing RuneQuest. <clears throat> and then a friend of mine, Steve Marsh, who had worked actually for TSR and knew Greg Stafford, who was the owner of Chaosium, told me I should send some of my stuff for uh, RuneQuest to Greg Stafford. And I did. Plus... I was Steve got me to try to design a horror modern era role playing game, which we called American Gothic. Um, he named it. I'm not sure what he was thinking. And so I told I told Greg about that, and he said he didn't want me to do American Gothic because he had the license to do a Lovecraft role playing game. And I I didn't panic exactly, but I went nuts. I said Lovecraft. <laughs> no one knows about Lovecraft. I love Lovecraft. Can I help in this in any way? Can I can I uh, read the text can i edit it what you know and then Greg calls back this is early 1980 and says well you know we don't like the work the guy is doing and so you can just have the whole project and so that was flabbergasted me i'd already done done one published thing for greg which was the gateway bestiary that was my very first published item which was so high quality that the um name of the game it was for RuneQuest was printed wrong on the front cover <laughs> So that was that was pretty glorious. Anyway, so I'd had a one published book under my under my belt, and then he gave me Call of Cthulhu, <clears throat> and I found out later on that he gave it to me because I was a big Lovecraft fan, um, because I um, had uh, was creative enough. He'd seen my other published stuff, and because I'd never missed a deadline. So that's those are some important things about being a published guy that a lot of people don't catch on to, you know. So the Lovecraft thing turned out that the reason he wanted me to do it as a Lovecraft fan is because Greg, in common with everyone at Chaosium and most people in the world, if you'd heard of Lovecraft, you thought of him as a hack 30s writer that wasn't really worth anyone's time. And that's what Greg and the rest at Chaosium thought of him. They thought Lovecraft was was a buffoon. All right? They'd never read him. You know, they just like, everyone says he's a buffoon. It's got to be a buffoon. Um, but But most companies, what they would do in that case is they would do like a snarky version of the game, you know, kind of like like Batman Three, you know, mm -hmm. you get Maker, and he doesn't really respect Batman. His people don't really like Batman. We'll just make fun of it. And of course, the people who actually want to go see the movie are the people that really like Batman, so they're turned off, right? That, but Greg was so smart. He said, if we do the Call of Cthulhu game, we'll make it a snarky. And the fans won't like it and will fail. So we're going to get someone that genuinely likes Lovecraft and not tell him that we don't respect it and see how he does. So that was, in hindsight, though I didn't know that was genius. When, so uh, call with, it through, when that's my career began. When you first got that assignment and then you took a look at the landscape of other games that were out there, I mean, you took a very dramatically different position on how to make a game compared to anything else that was in this realm at the time oh how yeah did, how did I, you I kind of tons of role-playing games you understand i'd been yeah. playing role-playing games for for 10 years by that time well not 10 years sorry uh 1980 would be six years still you know that's that's as much that's as much as anyone had you know it didn't exist before 1974 yeah. so i i did a very contrarian approach i said okay if, so if this is like a horror movie which is kind of how i based that on my head a horror story then you can't have them going around in dungeons and fighting monsters because like in the movie, the wolf man, you don't go fight the wolf man. He will just kill you. You know, you don't, you don't have a boss battle against Dracula. Cause he like, that's not how it works. You have to have do other things. And so I was casting around my mind for what would replace the combat aspect of role-playing games. And I, that's where I came up with the investigation thing that there'd be clues and unlocking stuff. And this proved to be apparently pretty compelling among people. The other thing that happened, and this is sort of serendipitous, is in Lovecraft stories, of course, his heroes are not very manly. And when they see a big monster, they often faint, okay? Or they panic or they go nuts. Going crazy is a big thing in 30s horror fiction, right? So I wanted to have that going crazy thing be part of the game. And so I gave, I invented the, the sanity system and my idea when I invented it is that this would be just another tool in the toolbox of the monsters. They could they could cast spells maybe, and they could they could set you on fire, and they could be scary, and they can make you go crazy. That's another attack method, right? So the very first time I tested the sanity system, 
it was in Davis, California. I was going to school there. Uh, and so I got the, um, I had the monsters going, the people were in the basement of the, it was actually the, uh, the Corbett, the haunted house scenario, which I think is no longer in Call of Cthulhu's core game, though it was for decades. It's now an expansion, but it's the most, it's the first scenario ever for Call of Cthulhu and it's, it's still available. So they're in the basement and they find this old moldy book and I say, oh, it summons a horrible monster from outside. And they thought that the horrible monster from outside might be what's haunting the house, though it wasn't, right? And so they got ready to cast the spell to summon the monster to deal with it. So I said, okay, well, you hear a scratching in the air and this thing starts to come through. And this is when um, I, I realized that I had accidentally come on to something, which is one of the players then says, I cover my eyes. Another one says, I'm running away. Another one says, I go into the corner, hiding my head in the corner because they didn't want to see the monster because it was scary and it would cause them sanity loss. And I'm not, I'm not saying the players themselves were scared, but because of the sanity rules, it made the characters act like they were scared. You know, you're playing D&D or RuneQuest, you would never cover your eyes from, maybe a Medusa, but you don't cover your eyes because you're scared. Like you want to see what's going on, knowledge is power. But in Call of Cthulhu, I had guys acting scared. And I, and I said, wow, I, I have... I, I'm on to something. And I, it, I love to say I was a super genius who planned it, but I wasn't. It just like, it came out of the rules I'd made. And, uh, and that would, became a real strength of the game. The characters acted scared. Um, and of course, the investigation thing. And the other thing is contrarian is that in Call of Cthulhu, in every other role-playing game, you like, you go and fight the bad guys and you get your loot and you level up and you go fight more bad guys and you get your loot and you level up and you go fight more. And that's a compelling cycle. I mean, everyone loves that cycle. Um, Call of Cthulhu doesn't have that cycle. You don't get better after fighting the monsters. You probably get worse. I mean, you get your treasure is a moldy old book that sends you crazy by looking at the pictures, right? <laughs> so so you, over time, you guys decay. And, uh, and what it turned out is that if you want to do the cycle of fight, get better, fight, get better, fight, get better, you can literally play every other role-playing game in existence. But if you want something different, Call of Cthulhu was the only thing that did that and it still is other horror games came out like chill or whatever but they didn't have they still were the same cycle as, as D, D or RuneQuest. they just like had a different kind of monster to fight call of Cthulhu remained the one that was spooky and scary and uh so a quick question for you like as far as like market share and all that kind of stuff goes when you put out call of cthulhu like i mean right now i mean obviously everybody knows dungeons and dragons and everybody now knows call of cthulhu but how was it received at that time I it, thought the, call of cthulhu, because nobody knew about lovecraft i thought that call of cthulhu was going to be these obscure cult game that would sell like three thousand copies i think that's all we printed for the first print run you know and among the fans and i'd be proud of it and then it would die and never be seen again you know, but instead, um, it kind of took off, and people, um, like w in 1986 uh, or, or later, I <clears throat> I would meet the guys from TSR at Gen Con and talk to them, and they told me that at TSR nobody played Dungeons and the Dragons anymore. They only played Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> so I know for a fact that it was affecting other hobby members. It, I, it was kind of like the Tom Waits of video games, and that other musicians listen to Tom Waits, but he's not popular in the general market so call of cthulhu everyone's heard of them and all the gamers play them but the regular population didn't have that many now it's bigger you know it survived so long i mean 43 is going on our 45th anniversary um and it actually has been huge in some places i, I went to spain this year for a convention i found out that call of cthulhu is the leading role-playing game in spain bigger than any other and apparently it's because um Watsi kind of screwed the pooch on trying to publicize uh, Spanish D and D, so it wasn't. It's not fully to my credit that we did, that we beat him, right? But when I went to Japan a few years ago, I found out that Call of Cthulhu is the leading role playing game in Japan, and not by a small margin. It's like seventy percent of the role playing games in Japan. Furthermore, most of the players in Japan are women. So, and there's more copies sold in Japan than the rest of the world combined. And it's huge in the rest of the world. So the average player of my game is a 18 to 35 year old Japanese one, which was amazing. Well, yeah, I was gonna say, I knew that it was the most popular in Japan by far. And I mean, one of the things to your credit is the, the whole onion skin method of peeling back the mystery layers and that cycle itself. And yeah. 
the well, immersion women, that is created. Women like scary stories as much as men. They yeah. don't need to have a giant muscled guy with a gun killing the monsters. And Call of Cthulhu like, lets you play the other way. I had noticed even in America <coughs> that Call of Cthulhu was more popular proportionally with women than Dungeons and Dragons. Like in a DD and d game, 90% of the players are guys. And of the women, like half of them are there because their boyfriend's playing. You know, but but in but in a Call of Cthulhu game, it'll be like 25, 30 percent would be women. Of course, in in America and the rest of the world, there's still D and D is the gatekeeper. You must play D and D before you're allowed to go through and play other role playing games, right? I mean, that's kind of how it works. So that I think that weeds out a lot of the people that would otherwise play Call of Cthulhu. But in Japan, where Call of Cthulhu is the first role playing game you're introduced to, then everyone can react to it naturally, and that's 70 percent are women. So I guess, I guess. They like the scary stuff, you know. Kind of like well, what happened in, with Ringu when it came out about 2000. Yeah. The Ring. yeah. Um, they made a, a really scary movie that didn't have any boobs and didn't have any gore. And, sudden, and suddenly women turned up in droves to see it because yeah. they like scary movies and they didn't want to see boobs and gore. You know, so, I mean, Call of Cthulhu can have gore, um, but uh, was... it's not visible. Was there ever any temptation to not have it set in the 20s uh, when you were writing it? or When I initially wrote it, it was not set in the 20s. Okay, My reasoning was that Lovecraft wasn't writing a period piece in the 20s. He was trying to write it with hard-cutting, edge-of-science stuff. He had submarines, which had only been around for about 10 years. He had airplane exploration of the Antarctic. He had ultraviolet rays. He had the discovery of Pluto. He had all this science stuff, okay? He was very interested in science. And he wasn't trying to write a period piece. Now, what happened is that when Chaosium was doing Call of Cthulhu, they knew that, they, they knew they didn't respect Lovecraft. And this is all stuff I found out after the fact. And yet they knew they were going to have to give a lot of support to this Call of Cthulhu game. <clears throat> so they had to find something in the game to kind of hang their hat on that they would like so they could enjoy designing it. And what they came up with was the 1920s era because the 20s is cool, right? So we'll set it in the 20s. And so, and that's why there's this big source for, for the 20s. And that's why I said in the 20s because they wanted to have something they could find. And they love doing this 20s stuff. So that way they could support the game fully and not have to read Lovecraft. Now, when I played the game, I played it in the 20s, but I didn't use any of the 20s stuff. I didn't have them write on Zeppelins or worry about what the... I just, like, they had a lot of things in the 20s. They, they had cars, they had guns, they had phones. I just used those things, you know? So a lot of my scenarios could have been played in the 1980s or 90s as easily as the 20s, right? Um, but, because, but because Chaosium was focused on the 20s, that's how it became the 20s. And that was more of them trying to make sure they could enjoy the game. Later on, they came to like Call of Cthulhu. And then people started thinking about the 20s place. When I play Call of Cthulhu today, I, I almost never play it in the 20s. It's all, almost always modern era. Or some special era. Like I have a, a campaign, a, a scenario I play said 1946. And I have another one said in 2500 because it's a futuristic thing. But they're all, I just set them whenever it's the good, right time for the thing. But a lot of my, but if, if I'm not interested in the time, it's, it's modern day. And in fact... Um, an announcement to make, which I've already made at Chaosium Con, which is that I'm coming back to Call of Cthulhu. I'm going to be doing more Call of Cthulhu uh, stuff, it, uh, licensed by Chaosium. I'm going to be and and part of the deal is that Chaosium wants me to do Call of Cthulhu stuff in the modern era, and they will keep doing it in the 20s. And of course, my stuff, though it's set, the first one's called Big C, which is S E E, not like the letter C. Yeah. Um, so Big C is a uh, a modern campaign set in Seattle with uh, like a drug cult run by the cult of Cthulhu. And uh, it does have rules in it for uh, if you want to play this in the twenties, here's some changes to make. So for example, the final confrontation in big C is in an unfinished super collider uh, built on one of the islands off Seattle. But of course you wouldn't have that in the twenties. So if you do it in the twenties, you change it into an unfinished subway track, but it, you know, it also works. And uh, how far along is that project? It's, it's finished. It just has to be illustrated and laid out. It's all written and edited. Um, it's kind of unique because you'd think that with a game called Call of Cthulhu, there'd be lots and lots of campaigns with Cthulhu as the villain. But yeah. the only campaigns I've, I haven't seen them all because there's so many. 
But but when I was working at Chaosium, the only campaign we did where Cthulhu was the villain was the Shadows of the Oxenthoth, our very first campaign. And Cthulhu only comes in as a bad guy in the last couple episodes. I don't think there's been one since then, so Cthulhu doesn't really show up as a villain very much. But but this campaign, Big C, it's the cult of Cthulhu. That's the, that's the enemy, and, Cthulhu, and, and Cthulhu himself, you know, or the threat of Cthulhu himself. There's star spawn. There's actually an ongoing um, like enemy you have that's a star spawn that shows up periodically, and you have to try to get away from him. You can't really fight a star spawn, right? They're the size of a dinosaur, but. Uh, but it's but it's 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 Cthulhu and it's modern era and it's set in Seattle and uh, I think it's got a lot of fun things. Cool. So, it's a hardback book, about three hundred pages thick, fully illustrated. So it's a whole campaign. It's set to last about six months. Cool. So I'm assuming that'll be out uh, probably in within months. Within months, because it's like I said, all we got to do is get it, is finish it, getting illustrated. It already has some of the illustrations done, um, like the cover art. Um, Get a few more illustrations, get it laid out on a page, get it printed, and, and it's fast to print. A lot of our thing, a lot of people have noticed that we are we are slow about printing things. That's because most of our stuff that we print, we first have to make um, uh, model molds for the figures. Then we have to cast the figures. Then we have to sort and glue together the figures. Then we have to, and all of that takes a lot more time than everything else involved in the game. But this is just a book. There's no figures, so it's just like really easy printing task and it goes right through and presto then we have it we're going to follow up with more uh Love, lovecraft stuff uh, i think our next item is going to be called the book of the shambler and it's a it's a source book for dimensional shamblers and the first half of the book has like amazing facts about shamblers and their background and places they live and where they come from what their plan is and then the last half of the book is several scenarios where you can play with shamblers so how did you end up kind of coming back to it? Because we'll talk about Peterson Games uh, soon, but how did you get back into Chaosium and uh, Call of Cthulhu? Okay, well, Chaosium may not like this, but the way it happened <laughs> it was that in 2016, I had a business partner who had uh, many flaws, but had some virtues. And one of his virtues is that he said we should do Call of Cthulhu for um, Paizo's Pathfinder game. Not Call of Cthulhu, but Cthulhu stuff. Uh, he watched you want to be a whole new Cthulhu game. I said, no, no, I did a Cthulhu game. I'm not going to compete with, with Call of Cthulhu. That's going to be my premier Cthulhu game. So we did the Sandy Peterson's Cthulhu Mythos for Pathfinder, which is a big source book. Then we started doing campaigns for it. And then after, uh, after then, and it like, it did really well. And then um, after a couple of years, we said, hey, let's do this for D&D &D as well. Because one of the reasons we did it for Pathfinder is because at the time we were doing it, Pathfinder was actually the biggest RPG in America for a while. You know, it kind of surpassed D&D &D for a while. But then it kind of sank mm -hmm. back down when the fifth edition came out. So we did Sandy Peters and Cthulhu Mythos for D&D. &D. And again, sold really well. Um, we decided to do more campaigns. We still have them in stock. And uh, everything was a critical role did a, did a, uh, a thing on us and it was all very successful. And then Chaosium contacted us and said, um, we want to buy all of your Pathfinder and, and D and D stuff. And we said, why? And they said, because we don't want anyone else to have Cthulhu except for us. And I said, okay, like, what's in it for me? And what was in it for me is that they would give me the full license to do Call of Cthulhu stuff with them. And uh, and the potential sales actually were better than D&D &D for us. Um, so uh, we said, you bet. Uh, we're still selling the D&D &D and Paizo stuff because we still have it. Um, and, we, you know, we can sell it off. But we're going uh, fully over to doing Call of Cthulhu. So that's why Chaosium basically got didn't want to have a competitor in Cthulhu. And just particularly, they didn't want me as their competitor. So now I am their now I am their firm ally instead. Cool. And that actually reminds me of the deities and uh, demigods, uh, Cthulhu um, yes. entries at that point. Do you remember that time? Oh, boy, do I ever. So what happens is that deities and demigods comes out. There's actually a really good video by Seth Skorkowski about this, in which I make an appearance. Um so you look in the Seth Skorkowski uh, video page, you'll you'll see me talking with him about it. And he actually corrects some of my misremembrances uh, from, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So, you yeah. know, go, go for it, Seth. Anyway, so so my memory of it is that I remember it coming in and everyone saying, hey, look, they have Lovecraft. And at that time, we had a deal with Arkham House that 
um, that we were the exclusive licensor of, of Call of Cthulhu. We also had a deal with um, uh, Michael Moorcock that we were the exclusive guy to do his stuff as games. And of course, Stormringer and Elric showed up in the in the book. And we also had a deal with Fritz Leiber to do Fofford and the Grey Mouser, which also showed up in the Eden Dynamic Guys. They just done it. They were so amateurish at TSR. They hadn't bothered to check with anyone's agent. They just like we'll put all these cool guys in. So we contacted them, <coughs> and we said, um, uh, "You are welcome to keep selling this and keeping this stuff in it. We don't care if you do, except." that you must put an acknowledgement in the front, special thanks to Chaosium Incorporated for the use of Elric and, Call of, and the Cthulhu stuff, okay? Now, Cthulhu is now public domain. It's not clear if he was a public domain in the 80s, but we didn't, we thought it wasn't. Everyone thought it wasn't, whether or not it was. So, and so what, what TSR did was they printed they did the first print run, and they did another print run, which had the special thanks to Chaosium, but they took out the problematic st staff, so they, like, paid the price without having the good stuff. Then, like, the later editions, they just left out the um, the thanks to and just didn't. So it just was a worse edition because it didn't have the Lovecraft stuff. Yeah. But we didn't make him stop it. We said, yeah, yeah, go ahead and do it. All we need, we don't need money. All we need, oh, we did, one other thing we got from him. We said, you have to give us permission to use D&D &D and AD&D &D in our Thieves World expansion, which they did. So, okay. So, so that was the other requirement. So we got to do that. And we didn't... So I know there's been statements that we made them stop doing it, but we didn't. We just said, just put a thank you. Who's going to read... It's on the title page. Who's going to read that? <laughs> the bottom of the title page. No one cares, right? But yeah. someone there cared. So maybe it was the Blooms. Those guys were... It, when you think about... Your, like, I mean... Uh... I'm I'm younger and I grew up like reading about reading the games that you were creating and that kind of stuff. But to be in the thick of it and now you're part of history books, how does that kind of feel? <laughs> well, it's I'm kind of amused by it, you know, because I because I I still don't really think of myself as a game designer. I think of myself as a guy, as that kid that likes reading weird books and seeing weird movies and and playing. Like my dad took me to Planet of the Vampires when I was like eight years old and I hid under the seat of the chair. I was so scared, um, but I still love that movie. <laughs> and, and the guy that liked to play games. So like a large, a, a powerful motivator for me when I design a game is that there's a game I want to play and I can't because it doesn't exist. And then I will go and design that game. So all the games I do are games that I do because I would like them. And so it turns out that, there's enough people who are bent like me that also like that game. But, you know, that was that's always been the impetus. There wasn't a horror role-playing game, so I made one. You know, one of the good things about it, it means I still like the game. I like the games I do. So when I'm, when I'm tasked to do a game on a topic that doesn't interest me, I can try to get my mind behind it and do it, but it's not, it's not ever the same. So I view myself as a fan like other fans. Just I'm a fan who is lucky enough to have been able to make a living doing games and what were you originally set out to do like in your life like did you have oh, other plans well, i was and going like... to school to become a zo professor of zoology and so i was studying zoology in college and uh my uh when i dropped out of graduate school to go work full-time for chaosium my wife was distraught she didn't tell me at the time she i've learned this i learned this decades later that she was like oh we're ruined he's never gonna have a job as a professor and she, you know, and that's going to be terrible. But the way I found out that she was distraught by it is when she said, man, I thought we were going to be these, these impoverished, of course, Cassian, we were impoverished with Cassian, right? That we was going to be this, this I, I, you'd ruined your future. And instead, like, she, I've tra she's traveled all over the world with me. I'm this well-known guy. I get to hang out with fellow fans. And, and you know, that's kind of fun because when I'm at a convention and the fans come by, we all get excited about the same things, you know? Um, and she gets to see that. And so she's like, it was a whole different direction her life was going to go. So she, uh, uh, you know, is, is really happy with it. She, I mean, she got to go to Japan with me and, and all the cute Japanese girls that have done their, their Call of Cthulhu, uh, uh, scenarios. They all, we met them all at the convention. There was like hundreds of them signed little tables with their one little scenario because open license there. Yeah. Cause the, oh, cause, cause, 
the company ArcLight, which does it, is smart, and they know if they do an open license, they'll, they'll get tons and tons more adventures. Because of course, the limiting factor on Call of Cthulhu is that the adventures are not easy to make. Right? They're mm -hmm. harder to design than a D and D adventure because you have to have the mystery stuff. So instead of having to do it all themselves, they let you know all the other fans do it. Anyway, I was trying to make my wife jealous with all the cute Japanese girls, but I totally <laughs> failed. She just laughed at me. So. And the zoology makes sense now because the Peterson Field Guide. Um, yep, that's where it comes from. It comes from my zoology background. Cool. And I know uh, we don't have a ton of time, and so I do want to kind of move on to um, okay. Ghostbusters. Which All right. So here's what happened. Okay. We were buddies with West End Games because really the way it worked – is that when you're a small game publisher, you're sort of buddies with every other small game publisher. You don't be, you, we weren't buddies with TSR because the guys in charge of TSR were like these, um, there were the blooms then, they were like these rapacious mobsters, you know, and the people that worked under them were, were okay, but they didn't ever last very long because they would do a giant purge every couple of years, or every year, and inspire everyone to hire new ones. So, you know, there was not any kind of cultural ongoing thing there. <coughs> Uh, my friend uh, Lawrence Schick told me that one year they uh, they went to every single person at the company and they said, to remain hired, you must name one project that you worked on in the last year. That was the requirement. And they fired more than 80 people. Oh, wow. So it's like, boy, they sure can't pick them. Anyway, so, but we're friends with West End Games and particularly with Eric Goldberg. So Eric Goldberg comes over to Chaosium and says, we got the, license, the right to do a... a uh, a, uh, this is 1986 to do a go well it's before then because that's when it was published it was like 85 we had the rights to do a Ghostbusters role playing game and and because Sandy Peterson uh, does does horror games we want to have him design it for us and I think Eric Goldberg thought it was going to be actually like a horror game like Call of Cthulhu instead of a comedy game which is what it has to be right a fan of Ghostbusters isn't going to go do it because he wants to be scared He's it's comedy yeah and um, and he kind of insulted me during it. Uh, maybe he didn't think it. He said, well, what have you done since Call of Cthulhu? And I was like, well, I mean, I did ElfQuest and RuneQuest 3 and Ringworld, you know, but and a bunch of other things. But, ah, he dismissed them all. because So he was the big, important New York game designer. And I was just this guy who had a flash in the pan. So I buckled down and said, we'll do Ghostbusters the right way. And we did. We made it comic. And I made up a whole new game system for it, which is still being used. You know, where you're yeah, almost I, I would, yeah. I would say I'll just say this one thing about the D6 system. Whenever like I play around with game mechanics or I mm -hmm. think about the game mechanics that are good, and it's not just me, it's everywhere. The D6 system is the most easy game. It is so to, easy to and up. it's so useful for the game master. He can control things as he wants. He'll just say, Hey, you know what? You get an extra 2D6 because you've heard of this kind of lock before. Or he can say, Oh, well, it's a Difficulty 30 because he wants, you know, he the game master has tons of power. The players know how to do things. It was really flexible. I was, uh, um, I'd like to take full credit for it, but I don't honestly remember how much Lynn Willis and uh, Greg Stafford had to do with it. I'm guessing it was probably mostly me because they weren't really system guys, but I will give them credit too. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so I was, I was proud of that system. Now with Call of Cthulhu, I didn't get to choose the game system. It had to be, um, uh, uh, the basic, basic yeah. role playing system, you know, uh, or it might have been different, but uh, so yeah, so I did Ghostbusters, <clears throat> and they were and Eric Goldberg was a little put out because it wasn't a true horror game, it was comic, but uh, they took it up there and they polished it up a lot and did things, and uh, and then of course, years later, I did a won an award, and then the game system kept going on and on, <clears throat> and in uh, the Hobby Games 100, which was uh, they got 100 authors to each list their very favorite hobby game. And uh, they, I was one of the ones. I picked uh, Squad Leader. You couldn't pick your own game. I wouldn't have anyway, but I picked Squad Leader. And two of the, two, the, two of the games in the Hobby Games 100 were mine. It was Call of Cthulhu and ElfQuest. Not ElfQuest, Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. So <clears throat> I was pretty proud that I had 2% of the uh, best games in the Hobby Games. Well, I mean, it's... Sort of my wife. It's an absolutely great game. I, I once in a while I'll just thumb through it and go like the the humor in it, and it was just the right tone to just to find that nice balance of the humor and the system. And a lot of people that were probably coming into it, like, did you know the strategy was like, you know, people that are going to play Ghostbusters might never have played a role playing game, or did you? Oh, I was well aware of that. So I wanted to make it a very simple system. You know, instead of having skills, 
I mean, you can have skills in it, but basically you just have the stats, right? Yeah. And uh, I talk, we talked about how if something's funny, you can give it an extra bonus. And yeah, a lot of the humor is from Lynn Willis. Um, I mean, I was I was kind of I mean, I did obviously some of it. Like I I, I made up all the the denture hooks are all mine with crazy stuff like the mummy's toe, you know? Yeah. Which was my favorite of all the adventures was that there was an evil mummy's toe going around and you had to it would show up like in your shot glass or something. And there was all the evil that a toe can do. Um, but it was like a ghost puncher kind of thing. So yeah, it was, we knew that people wouldn't have played role gaming games before. And, uh, and in fact, that was in effect two years ago, we'd had the, we'd blown it with elf quest. What had happened is that, uh, uh, Greg Stafford assigned, um, Steve Perrin to write elf quest and, uh, and for me to help him. And Steve Perrin at the same time was trying to design <coughs> the new edition of RuneQuest. <coughs> so he used elf quest as his test bed for RuneQuest three rules and rune quest three is kind of a hardcore role-playing game and i kept saying steve elf quest <coughs> is for comic book fans that like elves writing wolves it's not it shouldn't be this hardcore thing he says nah it's okay no one's gonna buy it anyway <coughs> and he and he refused to make any of the simplifications that i uh that i asked for and so it went out and it pretty much bombed because of, or you know the elf quest guys would pick it up and then there was a huge list of of stats and skills and bonuses and it was it took 45 minutes to make a character which is fun in a game like RuneQuest <coughs> but is not so great <coughs> excuse me oh, have, have a drink I'll, I'll just maybe uh I'll just talk for a sec here about uh brownie points as well because you have been widely credited with kind of that whole um player agency of using brownie points as like bonuses and and being able to manipulate the game mechanics that okay I the brownie points were mine um I wanted to have some way to give the players rewards and you couldn't uh, experience points didn't make so much sense in, in Ghostbusters. So brownie points was what you got. And, um, and now there's all kinds of things that use similar features to brownie points. They'll give you luck, you know, or Seth Skarkowski and other guys do the inspiration thing where if you do something brilliant, he gives you like a big Chinese coin yeah. and then you can spend it whenever you want for like a reroll or an extra die. And, uh, but and, and you have to spend it you only get one so if you don't use it then if you get a second inspiration point you can anyway brownie points were great and um i i think i mean i don't know where i came up with the idea i just wanted to have some other way to, to affect players that would be funny and i thought brownie points were a funny word for it well it's funny i mean uh i'm gonna do a shout out to uh Kyle Maxwell, who just did a, a write-up on your GM advice uh, in Call of Cthulhu, and then also just flipping through Ghostbusters before this interview and looking at some of the GM advice there. Uh -huh. It is really just a template for how games can be played and how simple <laughs> it, was, it is. It was the last thing I wrote, because Greg and Lynn said, okay, s someone might play Call of Cthulhu that's never played a role-playing game. You have to tell them how to play a role-playing game. And I was like, what? So that's where it came from. I said, well, the hardest thing to do is going to be run a game. So I tried to, I tried to put into, into words, like all the stuff that it would take to design, to play a run role playing game. And I guess it, it worked out, but it was, I'm not saying it was last minute, but it was the last thing I did, you know? Yeah. But it's, it's such a beautiful template in such simplicity. And then I'm sure you've seen over time. I mean, you took a side quest here for video games. And during that time, there was a whole new era of games that came in, yes. you know, story games and that kind of stuff. And it seems like now we're kind of going back to the origins of role-playing games to go, like, there's something special about that time. Yeah. Well, well, for a while, there was, like, everything must be storytelling. But my issue, I'm a very old-school gamer, obviously. I mean, it was there at the start. But my issue with storytelling was all of that. It can, it can easily devolve into... Um, if the princess is going to be rescued, she's going to be rescued no matter what the players do, because that's part of the plot. And if she's, the princess is going to die, she's going to die whatever the players do, because that's part of the plot. And you're kind of like, at least some GMs can railroad you that way. And uh, I've been in game campaigns like that. You probably have too. And uh, obviously the better way of doing a, story play, a storytelling game is to have everyone be part of the story moving it forward. But... I mean, kind of the way that I run my campaigns, and I've run some pretty long campaigns. One campaign was was uh, more than twenty years. You know, is is uh, what I would do is I would set up a problem 
for the players or situation and then have them have to figure. I didn't figure out how they were going to get out of the problem. That was their job. I just set up the problem and then they have to work their way out of it. And sometimes they would surprise me. In fact, they got pretty good at surprising me, which is fine because then I'm entertained too. But uh, yeah, totally. And I mean, that's one of the things that I always loved about, uh, is, you know, Cthulhu especially is that sometimes uh, the uh, the keeper can just sit back and just watch things unfold and have the ideas come. Yeah. And that's fun for me, at least. Yes. And the players, and, and of course, uh, if the players uh, aren't too guarded in their talk, they will give you really good ideas for what should happen next. Yeah. Like, exactly. Oh man, I hope that the police chief isn't part of it. And you go, oh, maybe. Part of it. <laughs> but the... <laughs> so just briefly, then you you got it from tabletop role playing games. You got into video games, and we yes. don't maybe not delving too far in, but you worked on such huge titles as like level design for Doom and Doom Two and Quake and Age of Empires and. Throughout all of that time, I, I really made a pretty good name for myself in uh, in the role playing community, in the video game community. And what had happened is that I, I'd been working for Chaosium for eight years, and I was penniless, and I had a family of four kids and a wife and me. And I was like, "This is this sucks." I'm living in California in an apartment, you know, with with six of us, and I need more money. And Chaosium is not going to provide it. So I went to Gen Con, and with Greg Stafford's knowledge. And maybe not blessing, but acquiescence. <coughs> I went, I went shopping around, and got a job at uh, Microprose Software, which is where I worked on uh, various things: hyperspeed, light speed, um, uh, uh, civilization. I was involved with. I mean, Sid Meier was the main designer, but I was involved with it too. You'll see my name in the credits um, and the other things. And then from there, I go to ID Software, where I was did doom doom Two, quake and then i went did the age of empires did all these video things but the funny thing is that when i am i, I get invited to, to conventions all the time okay as a, as a guest of honor so it's free they fly me out to spain or wherever and i get to do things it's never for my million selling uh computer games it's always for my board games or for or call of cthulhu the first game i did no one cares about Doom and Quake to spot me out for a convention. They just want to talk to me about Call of Cthulhu. And that's fine because the video games, people like them and they play them. But, but Call of Cthulhu is beloved. It has a place in their hearts, you know. And so that's the game that, that, that I guess hits home. So that's a uh, – uh, it's kind of heartening, you know. When you were doing video games – was there a PCU that always wished that you were doing role-playing games, but maybe the market wasn't there? While I was time? doing video games, I was playing role-playing games at home. And so, and, uh, so, and I would, and also I would go to conventions for Call of Cthulhu and I would run role-playing games there. And if you want to see the kind of conventions I ran, there is the product Peterson's Abominations from Chaosium, which has five of the convention events i would run and they're all super gory because i figured it's not going to be a campaign it's one time it's a one shot right so there are these horrible bloodthirsty things that are good for a one shot um but so i didn't have a need to go out and publish more role playing stuff i said i did some stuff i wrote a bunch of stuff up online for um uh empire of the petal throne a rune quest version of empire of the petal thrones magic i think that's still available somewhere and i made up some new magic systems for rune quest and that's available somewhere um and uh, so i was doing stuff with role playing but i but the the, the money from uh from video games was was spectacularly better than for working for chaosium okay and so i didn't regret making that move and then in uh 2009 uh, don matrick shot my company in the head ensemble studios um in an attempt to increase his stock options and hurt i think the stock value for everyone else that worked for Microprose. Microsoft because it was like <laughs> we were the, we were like the more okay I went out for a second yeah uh, you're back <laughs> okay but, but I, I, Ensemble Studios was literally Microsoft's most successful company but Don Matrick had evil plans right um, so I leave it I went and I worked at SMU Southern Methodist University uh, for two years teaching game video game development. <clears throat> to grad students, which is especially uh, ironic because I didn't actually finish grad school, but I was teaching it to <laughs> master's degree students. And every once in the school would say, why don't you have a master's degree in this? I said, no one was teaching it when I was in school. And who's fit the teacher to be? I've been doing this for 28 years. Who can teach me more about video game development like, yeah. academically? You know, 
I didn't want to, I wasn't arrogant about it like I'm sounding, but it was like really that's like going back to school. I mean, I can get an MBA. I don't know. Anyway, so I worked there for two years. Then the school bureaucracy got kind of onerous. You know, I could have stayed on. And in fact, they told me I could always go back whenever I wanted. Um, and then I left and uh, spent a year at a failed uh, iPhone game company. And then as times were tough and I was trying to be where to do next, I, a company from India called me and said, we want you to come and be our designer in India for a year. And we'll pay you this huge salary. And you have a company car because you cannot drive in Hyderabad if you're a Westerner. <laughs> And all these bonuses, you know, a, a share of the company, you know, it was a sweet, sweet deal. And so before I went, <clears throat> my other, some other friends of mine uh, imposed on me to do a Kickstarter for a board game based on Cthulhu. And that was the Cthulhu Wars game. Yeah. And I decided this is going to be the very last game I would ever design that was uh, fully designed by me. Okay. Uh, and it would be, <clears throat> so I pull out all the stops and make it my, my, my most glorious. It was even my swan song. I was going to then just go off and do uh, iPhone apps for an Indian company. And, uh, and Ghostbusters, did, sorry, Ghostbusters, ha, Cthulhu Wars did so well on the Kickstarter that I, I called the Indians and said, hey, you know what? I'm not coming. I'm going to stay here and manage this Kickstarter. And they weren't happy, but they weren't, they were more sad. They weren't angry. They were sad. Mm -hmm. And so I did, and then that founded my current company, Peterson Games, which has had its ups and downs, but is still in business. And now we've expanded into doing role playing stuff. And so I've come full circle because now I'm I'm doing like Big C and other expansion books for uh, Call of Cthulhu. So it kind of went wide around. And, and then and, a full sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, speaking of full circle, your son Arthur is the project director at Peterson Games. And I can't help but think when you look back upon your uh, history and your dad's influence on you and now your influences on Arthur and his role, is it kind of, uh, you know, the circle of life, so to speak? I, I guess it's kind of puts a lot of pressure on me to like, have I ruined Arthur's life or made it better? You know, <laughs> and, I, and I'm always worried about that. Uh, for a while, another of my sons, Lincoln, was working directly with me uh, in the company. Um, as an assistant game designer and uh so some of the games we've done were designed by him and they're very different games than the ones i would do so i was happy about that that he's not a clone of me he's got his own his own uh creative development system uh because that's how it should be you know um the uh I, you know as we kind of kind of wrap things up here when we talk about just like the peterson games and like the kickstarters when you think about like uh if you were a young um, Sandy Peterson starting out in game design and Kickstarter was available to you and print on demand was available to you. Like, what do you think the difference would have been? Well, I didn't know I was starting out as a game designer. I thought I was doing a side gig while I went to college to support my family. And it only gradually became a thing. I would say that, and I've said this before, I think this is the golden age of games because with Kickstarter and print on demand, literally any kind of weird quirky game can get out there. And with the advent of the internet and, and other media, you can make it so other people can learn about your game. And so we can get all kinds, of, like I remember there was a lot of, of, of pressure back in the day of like, you must do a mainstream game. And I never wanted to do mainstream games because to my idea, a mainstream game was always a game that offended as few people as possible. But I wanted to make a game that appealed strongly to some people. And that would be a better seller than a game that everyone kind of didn't hate, you know? And so that's what we did when we were working on Doom, for example, at id Software. We said, a lot of people are going to hate this, but some people will really, really like that. And that's our core audience. And I remember when Doom first came out, here's my Doom shirt. Um, yeah, and on the back of it, it says, wrote it. So I, I'd wear this <laughs> around at the Game Designers Conference. And other id guys would too. We called ourselves the idiots, right? We Because id. And, we, we'd, and they were like, oh, you did Doom. And then they would say, always say something like, oh, my company could never do a game like that because it was like too, I don't know. I don't know why they couldn't do a game like that. They all do it now, right? But they couldn't they couldn't do it then. And um, and it be, I think it's because, well, it'll offend the soccer moms. I said, well, the soccer moms aren't going to buy it. No, but but a lot of guys are going to buy it. and that's And so I learned that lesson. And so now when I do games, I do a game that I really like 
And so then I just say, rely on there being other people weird like us that will also like it. Well, and that has been my principle of game design, that to do a game that, that some people will really like regardless of other, other people hate it. Well, that might be a good way to kind of end our interview. And I hope uh, when the big C is out, it, you can come back and you can tell us all about it and, you and share some of the Happy details. So. Uh, I know you want to talk a little bit about the hyperspace role-playing game. I'll just say it's not finished yet. It's a science fiction game in the future set in the universe of my hyperspace board game, which is also not out. So obviously it can't come out before that. But it's a quirky universe in which... Um, the Cthulhu has risen up and wiped out the Earth. Because one of the things about Lovecraft's monsters is that they're mostly, a lot of them are space aliens. So if I do a game in space, why not have Lovecraft guys there too? It's not just about Lovecraft monsters, but some of them are Lovecraft monsters. And uh, so that's kind of a like a weird quirk. Also the fact that Earth has been destroyed and the humans are like wandering. We're rare and unusual in, in the universe. So it, it also gives the player kind of ongoing goal, which is if we can, we'd like to reestablish humanity. So unlike Traveler, where humans rule everything, it's more like humans, like, is that a human? Uh, bring the kids. We want to see them, you know? So ballpark uh, number, how many games do you have in your head that you could pull a trigger on, but they're all kind of percolating and spinning plates? Do game expansions count anything anything like i you you at at and i'll just maybe pause you there for a sec at your age you have not slowed down you are just as creative <laughs> as you ever were well i love doing this stuff and um i may have lost the um some of the uh, talent of youth but i still have experience to kind of make up for it <laughs> i i would say there's there's like a, a, a dozen or so different things in the back of my head and uh, there's some things that have been there like actually Cthulhu Wars is one of the things that had been there since 1988. All the back, I always wanted to have a game. One of the things about about Lovecraft Adventures and Call of Cthulhu is that is that they always the end of the adventure is when you stop Cthulhu from coming back, or you fail, he comes back and, and the game ends there. You never get to see Cthulhu in all his glory with all his toys in his toy box doing all that stuff he you know mountains of protoplasm rising from the sea telepathy blanket in the earth with mad visions all that cool stuff you never see that because the game ends before that happens so i wanted to have a game where you got to see that and um i actually ran several call of Cthulhu adventures took place like after the holocaust after cthulhu had risen humans trying to survive in a little bit and so call of, the cthulhu wars was my chance to see Cthulhu and the other guys come up with all their powers and all their game-breaking glory. And so that is the culmination of a dream I'd had since 1988. Um, so I finally got one of them out. There's other games I haven't got out yet, but I got that one. <laughs> well, uh, Sandy, I just want to say it's truly been an honor that uh, you joined us and uh, just a big fan. I'm sure I can speak on almost everybody's behalf to say thank you for everything that you've done for this little hobby of ours. Well, be sure to let me know when this is being uh, uh, broadcast and we will uh, use whatever tiny influence our social media has to help promote it. Well, uh, much appreciated uh, for your time and uh, just everything that you've done for us. Okay. Take care.